right. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is John Hegnorn, and we're going to be doing an AO Journal Club on mangled extremities. Uh, we have some few housekeeping items to go through before we start, and then we'll get to some uh, uh, excellent content. Uh, so again, my name is John Hegnorn. Uh, I'm at the University of Texas Medical Branch. And I'm joined by two great moderators, uh, Dr. Talarico from the University of Florida Gainesville and Dr. Marchand from uh, the University of Utah. Uh, we also have some great guest lectures and uh, AO faculty here tonight uh, to go over their papers with us, uh, Dr. Bossi, Dr. O'Toole, and Dr. Lee, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing uh, their perspective on their papers. Uh, there are some disclosures with this event. <clears throat> Here are the disclosures for uh, the individuals uh, participating. Uh, all these have been resolved and dealt with. And then here's the disclosure information for AO North America. Here's a, a content statement from AO North America uh, uh, stating that they're a uh, nonprofit surgical specialist society dedicated to improving the care of patients with musculoskeletal injuries. Uh, they do not particularly endorse nor promote the use of any product or service uh, of commercial entities. And uh, any of the equipment used uh, in this course is for demonstration and teaching purposes with the intent to enhance the learning experience. The last one uh, would not directly participate because we would not be using uh, drills and screwdrivers and plates and things here. Uh, probably one of the most important things is so we can maximize this learning opportunity is that uh, during the Zoom uh, uh, meeting, uh, all microphones should be muted and the cameras turned off. There is a question and answer box that's at the bottom uh, on the Zoom bar, which you can type your questions into and the uh, moderators uh, and myself will be uh, looking at those questions and either per, uh, giving them to our guest faculty uh, or we'll be answering them in the text box back to you. So please uh, type all questions in there. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, there's a chat box which will be used by the, the faculty and staff. Here's our general agenda. Uh, we're gonna start off with the welcome, which we're doing right now. We have three uh, videos uh, that we're interviewing uh, the respective authors of the papers. And then uh, at about 8.35, we're going to go into uh, about a 40-minute <clears throat> discussion and questions with the authors in live time, and we'll wrap up and adjourn. Um, this is part of a monthly series, which we uh, are interviewing uh, landmark papers and our authors to help uh, educate uh, all of you and us on to how to better care for uh, people with musculoskeletal injuries, and particularly for this session with uh, uh, mangled extremities, the learning objectives are as following. Uh, you should be able to list factors that are significant predictors of a poor outcome in leg-threatening injuries, discuss the challenges of amputation and limb salvage for the leg-threatening injury, and then finally, you should be able to integrate literature-based outcomes into the counseling of patients with leg-threatening injuries. Uh, future journal clubs coming up is on October 25th, which is tibia shaft, so I encourage everyone to register and do that. And uh, finally, there will be a Zoom recording, which will be put together uh, 24 hours after this. Uh, so if you want to watch it again or catch something, you can see that. And then finally, we don't have a slide for this, but I want to thank the AO staff, specifically Chris and uh, Beth, who helped run everything beside, behind the scenes and get this going. Uh, this, none of this happens without them. So thank you for your time, effort, and patience. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get the videos going and looking forward to a robust discussion later. This first video is uh, Dr. Michael Bossi as a lead author of the 2002 New England Journal of Medicine article titled An Analysis of Outcomes of Reconstruction and Reputation of Life-Threatening Injuries, and where he's answering the initial prompt about what prompted this manuscript in the Lower Extremity Assessment Project. Asking you, what prompted you and your collaborators to perform this study? I think we we were uh, we had returned from the uh, the first Gulf War um, and uh, were challenged with the uh, with the threat of uh, significant numbers of lower extremity trauma patients and preparation for those uh, casualties uh, led us all to understand that there's really no good evidence based medicine to guide our dis uh, decision making processes. So when we came back from the uh, the deployment. Um, Research showed that uh, 
there was a paucity of data and none of it really good, uh, uh, none of it prospective data. And we thought it was a very good uh, topic to look at, particularly in context of care of military casualties. Thank you. How do you view this, the LEAP study and this, this paper and this couple of papers is having impacted clinical practice, number one, and number two, what other effects has this type of study had for orthopedics and orthopedic trauma? Well, I think that this, um, this uh, serves as, as the, the, the basic foundation platform that surgeons can use in the shared decision-making processes with their patients who have severe high energy, low extremity uh, um, uh, trauma. I think it gives a good brushstroke of uh, the disability that the patients are expected uh, to have in either of the uh, treatment arms, the cost of the treatment arms, and the complications the patients are uh, uh, likely to encounter so that uh, the patient and the surgeon can you know, come together to make a decision that's best for that patient. Um, I think it's important that um, that uh, there are some, we, we did recognize some areas that, uh, that were particularly um, uh, unexpected outcomes from the, the LEAP study that require um, further uh, research and that the return to work of both groups was dismal at 50%. And the question is why and how do you fix that? Um, I think that the clinical uh, other things that occurred from the uh, LEAP study is that up until that time, we were, we were weighing our, our decisions uh, heavily weighted in some centers uh, based on the limb salvage scores, the MESH score, the, the, um, the Hanover uh, fracture score, and, and there were five scores at that time. And I think the LEAP study collected the data in a blinded fashion and showed that the scores had no relevance at all in the decision-making process. And uh, in fact, as I think Tom Lee will discuss later, you know, really don't, don't predict the outcome at all. Um, we showed the plantar sensation, which at that time was thought to be a, uh, a harbinger of bad outcomes and a, a reason that we might amputate. Uh, an ex extremity, if you were missing plantar sensation on missions, was basically a falsehood, and we we put that to rest. Uh, I think one of the biggest things we we showed, um, and and we convinced ourselves that we needed a better way to define the injuries. Um, as all of us now know, a type three B fracture, you know, with no bone loss and a quarter size defect over the pretibular area that requires a fascicutaneous flap, is not equal to a um, loss of the anterior compartment, eight centimeter uh, bone loss, heavy contamination, and a massive defect requiring a latissimus flap. So those are two different injuries, but you know we score them the same, and uh, we have to get away from that if we want to do really good discrete research into how to best come up with decisions for these patients. I think I, yeah, I think that the, the LEAP study, well, when it combined talents of the, I think it was the first time the orthopedic surgeons recognize that you know a surgeon's job is to operate and come up with the questions that need to be answered and that we have partners in the public health or um, uh, in, in other uh, of our um, health sciences that are better um, positioned and more knowledgeable in doing clinical research and the partnership of the two can be a very strong team so um, Conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan started, and, and the Department of Defense was looking uh, for research consortiums to you know, explore extremity trauma outcomes and advances. Uh, we were well positioned to apply for the funding, and the LEAP uh, study became the metric consortium, which is now in 80 some centers across the country doing 35 prospective studies. So we use the experience from LEAP, I think, to uh, jumpstart the, you know, the next step in the research process. And carry- Do people talk about this? What do you feel like is misinterpreted or is a message that you don't think actually is what re is reflected in your manuscript? Yeah, I think if, if we, knowing what we know now, in retrospect, we would, have, we would have staged the conclusion differently because I think too many surgeons read the paper and they say, uh, since uh, amputation uh, and limb salvage are the same, and limb salvage is less expensive than amputation over time, then the goal should be salvage all patients. And that's not what we said. You know, we can't 
we, you know, we came to come close to making a statement. What we basically said was that good surgeons making good decisions, and in most cases in, in the 1990s, the surgeon's thought process was, you know, if I salvage the leg, will I get an extremity that is at least as good as the best level of amputation? And if they felt that was true, they would save the leg. If they didn't, they'd amputate. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we've, we've kind of um, advanced that to the point where sometimes you, you wonder if the, uh, the question becomes, if I can uh, maintain blood supply or obtain blood supply, then it's a salvageable extremity, which probably isn't true. And we still have to struggle with the idea is, it, you know, is it, uh, is it possible and is it advisable? Um, you know, we could, with our technology, we can possibly save every extremity. The question is, you know, what's the advisability of that? How does our decision affect the patient outcome? And we still really don't have good information on that. I, I term this the uh, uh, leap effect. In our current studies we're doing in metric, we, you know, we have adjudication panels and we see cases in our adjudication process of, well, uh, patients who are placed in the limb salvage pathway uh, that under the old LEAP study would have never been in that pathway. They would have been amputated, uh, you know, because that was the treatment at the time. And I guess a, the best example I can think of is the, you know, increased uh, attention to uh, free tissue transfers for completely degloved tissue loss plantar sensation of the, uh, plantar uh, surface of the foot. Um, you know, 20 years ago, they were amputated. Um, and in the LEAP study, we had no patients with that injury that were salvaged. Uh, now, you know, it's a, we'll put a flap on it, put it in a shoe and see what happens. And probably not the best treatment as we see from some of the retrospective studies that are coming out from that. And I'm afraid that maybe that process was initiated by, you know, the misinterpretation of what we really meant to say in the LEAP study. Professor, can you talk about journal selection for this study? Paper. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously, whenever you do research, you want to gear to the, you know, highest tier um, uh, publication. Um, when we designed the study, we designed it with the intent that we would have a, you know, well, well designed, uh, well controlled uh, uh, data platform that would give us good information. We thought when we were finished that the, the information was was of value to more than just the orthopedic community. And we thought that it did rise to the level of the New England Journal of Medicine. And our research team, uh, you know, all senior orthopedic surgeons uh, agreed that that should be our, our target journal. Uh, and, you know, luckily we were accepted. And, <clears throat> and I think that brought, brought uh, some significant attention to the orthopedic trauma community that we could, we could actually do a project that would make it to that journal. Mm -hmm portions within the uh, tables or the, or the results that you feel aren't discussed in the body as much, but you still feel are very important to orthopedic trauma surgeons in the AO community today? Oh, absolutely. I think that the, 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 the biggest finding, if you look at the table and results and look at the infection rates in the, in the uh, uh, type 3B and type 3A tibial shaft fractures at 25 and 32%, and that's 25 years ago, right? And so what's the infection rate in 2002? It's still 25%. So despite all of our attempts to move the needle on infection, and infection equals complication, and we're, one of the drivers of bad outcome in this, in, in this uh, study or poor SIP scores was the treatment of a major complication, i.e. infection. So we really haven't moved the needle on infection, and infection probably still requires uh, or should be our, our major focus in dealing with the extremity trauma. Um, the recent studies from metric are still showing a 25 to 29% infection rate. Um, and you know, a quarter century later, despite you know, best of breed month techniques, tissue friendly techniques, you know, use of uh, ring fixers or no ring fixers, we haven't changed anything. And that's disappointing. Or any, any methodology changes you would make? Yeah, I think there, the, the, I mean, you know, we didn't know what we didn't know back in, in the, the early 1990s. But I think if we we're going to re, uh, redo the study now, I would I would focus on more discrete injuries. So we had a broad stroke and took everything of high energy, low extremity trauma below the distal femur 
and that you know gave us foot injuries, severe ankle injuries, tibia fractures, and proximal tibia fractures in these uh, locations. So it's probably a two a uh, very broad group. I think I'd probably try to focus on more discrete injuries, uh, um, um, and also you know with the uh, I think patient reported outcomes uh, have changed a little bit. The SFMA is much easier to uh, to use than the SIP score was. Uh, but the SIP score was well well validated in multiple languages and in multiple disease states. So you can compare the orthopedic trauma patient to somebody with a stroke, to somebody with a, you know, heart disease, and we got good information from it. The SFMA is becoming the preferred, you know, um, uh, uh, patient reported outcome for orthopedics. However, it has some disadvantages. We don't know what the MCID is in most cases, and we have no ability right now to compare it to other conditions. So, and then the MCID from for a simple ankle fracture is different than for a say severe tibia fracture. Um, so we have to we have to better understand our patient reported outcomes. I think that the other thing is uh, we use walking speed as a uh, as the a gauge of uh, physical performance in leap study, and in subsequent uh, studies we've learned that there are better functional tests that we can use. Um, you know, the first work to step test or the time stair ascent or you know the uh, other uh, a battery of tests that can be easily performed that give you better um, a sense of how patients actually perform. I think lastly is that what we didn't capture in LEAP and we should have in retrospect is that amputees are affected by the, uh, the skin prosthetic interface. You know, if it hurts, it might not, it might be that the amputation is good, but your prosthesis is not good. So we need a better, we need to do a better job of capturing the impact or the influence of the prosthetic on the results given by the amputee, because it might be that all they require is a more experienced prosthetist who can better fit and align the prosthesis. Uh, and that needs to be captured because, you know, we're, we may be under, understating the, um, the, the potential of an amputee by not uh, capturing, you know, the, a bad impact from the prosthetic. Key, two key points or three key points that you hope that they take away when, the, when they read this manuscript. Well, you know, I, th I think that I, I, I'd like them to, to take away in the, in the context of, of modern medicine, you know, the, uh, the use of this information and the to share, share decision-making process, that the patient can be educated, you know, I think very, uh, very nicely with this uh, uh, information in the, or the information relief study. Um, the pathway of, of uh, uh, recovery if they have the usual reconstruction or the usual amputation. You know, I, I think I also tell my, 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 my residents that uh, probably outside of your question is that not, not every patient should be given a shared decision-making process. You know, the patient who we see in the current metric studies who was given the option of you have a completely degloved foot, no tissue on your foot at all, uh, plantar surface or dorsal surface, but you're in the limb salvage path. So, you know, what do you think? So the surgeon should have said to that patient, you know, you don't have an option. You know, you need an amputation. And I think we need to learn when to use the, the shared decision-making information of the patient and specifically when to say, hey, listen, uh, I'm the adult in the room and your outcome is going to be far worse with a reconstruction than it is with an amputation. Therefore, I can't off, I can't offer you, you know, uh, a reconstruction because I think it's not ethical, uh, at least in my mind. I think the other thing that's important is that before we start talking to the patient about treatment options, we need to ask the patient what they want, right? And you know, I think a great uh, First question uh, that I wanted to ask you is kind of what led to this study being performed and what was the background to, to starting this? Yeah, certainly, as you know, uh, low extremity, especially mango extremity fractures can be very challenging to, uh, to manage and, uh, and trying to decide should we amputate or should we do a limb salvage. 
certainly we have a lot of those scoring system uh, that we'll talk about uh, was um, been reported to be a good predictor of uh, whether you should amputate or do a limb salvage. So previous study uh, in the LEAP uh, where they actually said that it couldn't predict uh, whether you should amputate or not. Then the next question we wanted to know was um, if it doesn't predict whether you should amputate or, or do a limb salvage, could it predict functional outcome? As you know, uh, this is a time where x-ray can look good, you know, viable limb can be, you know, viable, but is it functional? And what we wanted to know was, um, can it predict functional outcome, which is probably the biggest thing that we care about, uh, especially from a patient standpoint. Okay, awesome. And so, um, in looking at the paper, just kind of looking at the design, some people may look at this paper uh, compared to other LEAP studies and say, you know, you were looking at outcomes at six and 24 months. Um, and other LEAP papers looked at the SIP at two and seven years. So can you speak to maybe uh, why those time points were chosen uh, compared to at six and 24 months compared to two and seven years in this paper? Yeah, so so at that time, you know, we had the information we got to uh, mainly looking at the uh, we knew that the SIP score improved uh, from six months to uh, 24 months, uh, but we actually wanted to find out, you know, could it predict um, uh, whether the, uh, there's a correlation with the, the functional outcome uh, during that time frame, and we actually found out that there was really no uh, uh, correlation at all, uh, even though there was improvement from six months to 24 months overall for those patients at limb salvage. But when we actually just look at those, you know, six months and 24 months, we didn't notice that there was a, a correlation at all. So I, I think we didn't feel that was necessary to, uh, you know, take it to the, the seven year data at the end, you know. Okay, so essentially you didn't think a difference would exist. Yeah. At seven years. Okay. Yep. Uh, excellent. Okay. Um, and, you know, your paper really kind of shows, as you've alluded, uh, kind of talked about that uh, the five lower extremity trauma scores really did not predict functional outcomes. That was the summary of the paper. So uh, I guess the first question is, do you, do scores have any role in your practice today in dealing with these patients uh, with mangled extremities? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Actually, part of the study was like, could we create a, a new scoring system? And I think our intention, we wanted to do that, but it has not materialized. And so, as you know, there's so many components that come into that, you know, age, uh, shock, uh, soft tissue, especially nerve, uh, arterial, uh, skull, all those things uh, are a huge factor. So, for me, it has not, uh, and we certainly discuss a lot about it, but I think uh, it's no longer uh, something that uh, where we um, utilize, or at least I do utilize the score to decide, yes, we should amputate or we should not. I think this is uh, what we do now, or I do, is that um, uh, try to put everything together, both the objective and the subjective, and if it's something that I need to do an acute amputation, I actually will get a second opinion from the uh, vascular surgeon or the general surgeon or often the plastic surgeon to see is this something you can cover. So I use more consultant uh, um, to, be, to so have that second surgeon if I'm gonna do acute amputation. However, if it's something that I don't need to acutely amputate, uh, and there's time to make that decision, then I actually will uh, talk to the patients and essentially provide them with the data, especially from the LEAP study, uh, in terms of if they were to go this route, this would be likely the outcome or the, uh, the complication. And if they were to go the salvage, this are the, the, the outcome and the challenges. And so by doing that, then I, it's a shared decision with the patients is what I do at this stage, if that helps answer that question. 
Yep. And um, to kind of circle back to a point you made earlier, as you said, maybe from this study, you would come up with a scoring system that did predict functional outcomes. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that some more and talk about, you know, maybe uh, what the ideal scoring system uh, may encompass and maybe what it may not encompass to predict functional outcomes. Yeah, I think uh, one of those it would probably be, you know, uh, soft tissue. Uh, I think it's going to be the key on that one. I think we can get a bone to heal uh, or, um, or to maybe hopefully, you know, get infected bone to um, to um, to be eradicated with, you know, I and B and antibiotic. Uh, but the question is. How is it that patients still have pain, even though the bone is healed and the infection is gone? And I think a, a lot of it has to do with the soft tissue uh, that is um, both can be objective, but it's more subjective. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, the, um, to add to the scoring system, I think you have to have some component of the soft tissue. And I think the other one is the, um, um, I would probably say like, uh, getting the consultant involved, you know, with regards to the vascular surgeon, uh, the plastic surgeon, uh, and so getting that second opinion. This is where at at uh, uh, essentially uh, where we're at at uh, MGH wise, we have a good uh, orthoplastic uh, relationship, uh, where it, it's a sort of a having uh, a second surgeon like that uh, that can help you with uh, regards to soft tissue. Uh, is very helpful in terms of uh, consulting, um, consult, consulting uh, the patient as well as uh, discussing whether we should uh, amputate or not. So. so that's interesting. So it seems like you almost, a lot of these scoring systems are uh, done by one group of surgeons or a surgeon and a decision yep. is made. So maybe in your, your perfect scoring system, it actually might include multiple specialties assessing the patient rather than one surgeon which is yeah that yeah, yeah that's definitely correct right because you know if the plastic surgeon don't think that can do a good soft tissue coverage or can do something that's uh, meaningful and is likely to be successful then i think you have to push more toward the route of amputation and then the other one is you know the vascular surgeon getting them involved in terms of um in terms of you know is this something that you know, do they have a good uh, flow to the to lake and what's the ischemic time, you know, and, and that sometimes can be, is it, is it, you know, is it has it been six hours, has it been eight hours, mm -hmm. and, and it can be a challenge to to know that when a patient's coming in, how long does that limb been ischemic wise, you mm -hmm. know, so. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting perspective, very, very nice, so. Yeah. Um, so one final question, as as the lead author on this paper, um, what do you think that the people on this webinar should ultimately take away as a message from the paper you wrote? I think the, the message to take away is that uh, those scoring systems, you know, were really meant to be probably try to predict whether you should amputate or, or, or do a limb salvage, but it was not really meant to, uh, to predict functional outcome. And so that study just kind of proved that. I think the message is uh, when deciding, you know, whether you should amputate uh, a limb or not, I think you have to uh, rely on, you know, seeing the patient, uh, assessing uh, uh, the soft tissue bone and, and, and then discussing with uh, other colleagues if it's something in my mind where you need to amputate it uh, immediately, then you have to... Uh, try to get maybe a second opinion uh, with the acute care surgeon usually in-house uh, to, to, to do that. But I think uh, in the standpoint of using the score to try to uh, predict, I, I think it's, um, you have to use it cautiously. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for your time tonight and yep. uh, looking forward to further discussion about this. Great. All right, good evening, everyone. I think this will be the last article we cover in this uh, AO Trauma Journal Club on the Mangled Extremity. Um, with me tonight 
is Dr. O'Toole, a great uh, fellowship mentor and friend of mine, as we're going to go over one of his uh, more important pieces of work from the early 2000s uh, tonight as part of the of the journal club. So the paper we're reviewing today is entitled Determinants of Patient Satisfaction After a Severe Lower Extremity Injury. This is a paper published in JBJS in 2008. One of many papers that came on the heels of the New England Journal of Medicine publication from 2002, or the, the paper we all know as the LEAP trial, which was looking at outcomes in patients um, with severe lower extremity or limb-threatening injuries, reconstruction versus amputation. So with that, we'll just start with the kind of the easiest opening question, which was, why this study of, of all of the papers that came out of LEAP and all of the, the data that was collected during that incredible effort in the early 2000s, what sort of piqued your interest in this topic of uh, kind of patient satisfaction determinants? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, the, the way, what they wound up doing with LEAP is they had a whole list of, of papers and they couldn't get people to write them because there were too many projects and not enough people to write them. And so, I got involved because I was a fellow at the time and they were just sort of begging people to write lead papers. And so uh, there was a different paper I wrote initially and this kind of grew out of that. And so I don't know that I certainly had some grand plan uh, as to which paper to do. I was like, this is the one they wanted me to do. So I was like, okay, I'll do that one. But um, I, think it's, I think it is sort of interesting and it gets asked commonly on the OITE uh, or self-assessment exams. I almost always miss it and I'm saddened to see that this is the reference. But um, it is, I think it's, you know, it, it's sort of interesting because patient satisfaction still, and you know, at the time was growing in interest and people were using it more as a marker of care. And I think kind of the thought going into this is what we thought we would see is that, you know, the die is cast and that, you know, patients, you know, are going to have these basically unchangeable risk factors for patient satisfaction and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's sort of what we thought we would see in the paper, which in the end is not what we saw. And so I think that's why why it makes it sort of interesting. Yeah, just as sort of a quick aside, because I was thinking about this as I was reading through the paper, uh, take me back to 2008. Did Press Ganey exist back then? Because it seems to me in reading the manuscript that this is sort of on the precipice or the cusp of us moving away sort of from physician focused measures of outcome and more towards the sort of patient satisfaction, patient centered, uh, outcome emphasis that we sort of are are currently um, that we're, that we're sort of that we sort of currently emphasize. Yeah, I think that's fair. I mean, it certainly wasn't you know like one of the first papers in patient satisfaction or anything like that. There had been lots of papers in other domains, but it was uh, I think that it was definitely in a, an upswing of people's interest in moving more towards a, a more patient centered view of research and of care. And so it's certainly, you know, I don't think we had, it wasn't as ubiquitous for sure that patient satisfaction was, you know, part of physician payment or, you know, issues like that, that certainly hadn't arrived yet. But this was, you know, in the time where people are getting more and more interested in that. Yeah, and I think what's sort of cool and something you guys emphasize in the introduction of the paper is just that uh, surgeon and patient, um, experience of the patient's outcome can definitely vary, right? A surgeon can think somebody's doing well and the patient can obviously think they're doing poor or vice versa. And so that's why it's sort of nice to have, to, to see, um, see a patient outcome through both lenses. So ultimately you all end up with 463 patients in this study, which included 331 patients who went reconstruction or limb salvage and 132 um, amputations, all with patient self-reported satisfaction scores at the two-year mark. You all looked at a variety of outcome measures that included clinical outcome measures of function, pain, and psychological impairment, as well as treatment variables and some sociodemographic data. And I will just summarize the results quickly. So after taking all of those variables. And within each of those broad variable categories, you all had a bunch of subdomains. And you end up with 66% patients reporting a uh, satisfactory uh, outcome. 34% were not satisfied. And basically what you all did was dichotomize that there was five levels of satisfaction you measured. You took the top two and called those patients satisfied. 
The bottom three called those patients essentially unsatisfied. And in the paper, you mentioned a couple of times that you analyze the data a variety of ways and analyzing that variable continuous versus dichotomous yielded the same results. So you just reported the simpler of the two. And you ultimately determined that basically five outcome measures were the most important or accounted for 35% of the variation in patient satisfaction. These included return to work, having no depression, uh, the physical functioning component of the uh, sickness impact profile, and self-selected walking speed and pain intensity. So with that sort of general um, summary of your results, was there anything surprising? You sort of alluded to this already with my first question, but walk me through these results and how you were interpreting them at the time. Yeah, I think what we thought we were going to see, or at least I thought I was, we would see, is that there were injury characteristics or patient psych baseline characteristics or socioeconomic factors or something that would predict satisfaction. You know, if, if the sickness impact profile, which is kind of like SF36, it's just not very popular now, but that was the main outcome in the, in the original study is influenced by socioeconomic factors and all these sort of soft things. Well, well, surely an outcome like patient satisfaction will be very influenced by that, but that's not what we found at all. So I actually find this paper to be somewhat hopeful. It doesn't prove this, but it shows that the patient satisfaction is actually driven by hard outcomes, like how much pain do you have? How fast can you walk? And not by what is your likelihood of having a psychiatric disorder or what is the, in did you get amputation or reconstruction? And so it doesn't prove this, but it, it certainly, gives you a hint that perhaps if we can make patients pain better or make their walking speed better, their satisfaction would be better. And so I find it to be a hopeful uh, paper in, in that regard and that we didn't find that, hey, the die is cast when we met these people. They're going to be dissatisfied because of, of you know, these factors that they had at baseline. There's nothing you can do about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I read this paper and I leave feeling pretty optimistic. Um, not not necessarily that we're getting a lot better at treating these bad injuries, but that there's hope that we can, because if we can make all those things that I feel like as a surgeon, I can potentially impact the quality of their outcome, potentially their pain and their function, that it could be meaningful for patients, right? The, the, the result you were expecting, I would have found quite depressing given that, you know, we invest, these are some of the hardest cases, um, that we invest a lot of our time and energy into. And so it, it's, I think, encouraging and optimistic that potentially all of that effort is for something or hopefully for something. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with you. Now, having said that, you know, there's probably some components of this that the result is driven by the study population, right? So yes, the specifics of the injury didn't matter. That's because they were all terrible injuries. So if you added in a bunch of, you know, closed ankle fractures, they're probably more satisfied, I would guess, I don't know. And so, you know, then the injury would come in and you wouldn't have, you know, so many people dissatisfied, perhaps, or I don't know, maybe that's not true. But, you know, obviously this, this is in this patient population and it might be, you might get slightly different results if you broaden it out. Yeah, I think the way to, you know, um, succinctly say is that in this homogeneous population of really bad injuries, perhaps a difference can be made. Um, but certainly the injury undoubtedly is driving their outcome to some degree, but within this, there are factors that potentially we can influence uh, to the benefit of our patients. I mean, just one comment on that to tag up what you're saying there, although you don't know, right? Because you know, I'm sure you've had the experience where sometimes people with really bad injuries actually have low expectations and are quite pleased that, you know, they walked again because they thought they were going to never walk again. Whereas, you know, the sport, sporting athlete with their, um, you know, very mild ankle fracture is not happy that their 40 time just dropped by two tenths, which is a big deal to them. Yeah, that, that's actually a nice segue into one of the comments I had and, and something I wanted to get a little bit of your insight regarding, which is I thought one of the most interesting findings, I, I think there's two incredibly interesting findings that are less emphasized in the paper because it's not what the paper is about. But one of them is that 
66% of people were satisfied following a, a mangled extremity. That number for me is higher than I would have expected. Um, how about for you? Yeah, for sure. And I think it may, I don't know. I mean, obviously it could be the way we defined what meant to be satisfied. And it could be a commentary that the, you know, these are physicians at eight centers, at big centers, that did this, a lot of this stuff in this time period, that maybe they do an okay job of setting expectations for the patients or hanging a lot of crepe and saying like, you know, this is going to be a disaster and you're, you know, it's going to change your life and it's going to be horrible. And then when maybe it's not so horrible, uh, they're, they're, you know, a lot of them are sort of satisfied. They maybe we did an okay job communicating what was likely to happen. I don't know. That's a good question. And I agree with you. I'm, you know, these are, these leap injuries are very bad injuries. And if you kind of look at what's in there, um, it, it is, I agree. It's somewhat surprising that that many people are satisfied. And then I, I also found it interesting that having a major complication was sort of, um, fringe significant, if you will. And that also, as part of that, the number of surgeries somebody had didn't seem to impact their satisfaction. Um, I thought both of those were, were quite surprising. Yeah, I mean, it probably, you know, it's just, it's very interesting, right? You got, that's why we do research, right? It's hard to guess at what the results are before you do them. Now you can make up all sorts of explanations. You know, I'm sure you've had this experience. Some of the patients who you have the most positive relationship with that's not what patient satisfaction is measuring but you know maybe related are often patients who have big complications that you have a lot of interaction with right you have a very strong relationship with them because it's going really poorly and um so maybe you know from a satisfaction standpoint i don't know maybe there's a, a component or a social component of interaction with the healthcare that isn't as ne all negative uh, because they see that you know people a bunch of people have come together and really care to try and help them with their complication i'm completely making that up you know i have no idea if that's true but you know maybe that that would be obvious oh my leg has pus pouring out of it that's bad for satisfaction maybe there's a little bit more of a wash there it'd be interesting i'm not certainly no expert on what drives satisfaction but it would be it'd be interesting to uh, you know have somebody who's a you know a psychiatrist or somebody who really understands those those components that go into that, those, uh, those outcomes. Yeah, I think it, it goes to show us a little bit that satisfaction is a complex thing to measure. Certainly, like you said, a, a lot of people know more about patient satisfaction than I do. Um, what way, if in any, has this sort of changed your current clinical practice or should it make changes or suggestions to my or others listening's clinical practice? Yeah, I don't know that it changes anything except what you said I can be less depressed while I'm doing it. Like I can feel like <laughs> hey, maybe there's some hope here that you know, maybe maybe Mrs. Jones is not satisfied in anatomy because she's got a lot of pain, and I should figure out how to have less pain, and maybe she'd be more satisfied that in her outcome of her leg. So um, I think that's one thing. And then from a big picture research, you know, I think it encourages us to you know look at you know having depression leads to bad outcomes what can we do to stop people from getting the disease depression after their trauma you know, it gives us some hints as to where we can go if we want to improve patient satisfaction as patients and maybe we should pick these different areas and their targets for us to do future research and, and improvements so i don't know that it tells me a ton uh, about how i change my day-to-day -day practice but i think it does give you some sort of hints for the future and it always these things are always useful I think LEAP in general is super useful in, in yeah. talking with patients, right? It just gives you, it allows you to quote off a bunch of facts about, you know, how bad the injury was, and what your likelihood of this, that, and the other thing happening is. Um, and that's probably, in, this stage probably in that category. Is it useful to you? What do you, what do you think? Yeah, I think exactly what you said is that the most useful part of this is that it makes me um, encouraged that the work I'm doing is very important and potentially significantly impactful. Um, that and um, I think it's it's useful when you have this information and you're able to convey it to patients. So one of the things I typically harp on is um, making an emphasis following bad injuries and trying to get people back to work. And this is one of the papers that points out that that's an important part of your recovery process. I think there is psychological implications there, getting back to work and feeling like you have a place and a purpose in life. And so 
it's um this paper reinforces a lot of that for me which i find awesome yeah that makes sense um that brings us to the time limit so with that i think this is one of a few papers you've had on this journal club so i would congratulate you i think that means you're doing um and have done impactful work that's hopefully changing and shaping the face of orthopedic trauma and thank you for your time this was awesome um oh, i appreciate of course. You carving yeah. away some time to do this no i really appreciate it obviously i didn't do this right like a whole bunch of people came together i was just the you know junior person who wrote the paper but uh and, and so, you know, I think that's one of the cool messages of Leap and all the papers they did after that, right? Is a bunch of people came together to crank out, you know, 40 some odd papers. And uh, I think some of them were really useful. And, you know, Helen McKenzie and Mike Bossy led this huge effort with a bunch of people at centers and all these little papers like this that weren't the main paper came out. And so it's a testament to them and their leadership that they were able to do it. So, but thanks for having me on to talk about it. Appreciate it. You got it. All right. See ya. Sorry about that. Uh, technical glitches happened. So uh, thanks uh, for all those interviews. Uh, we're now going to go on to the live session with Dr. Bossi, Dr. Lee, and Dr. O'Toole. And as a reminder uh, in the audience, if you have questions, uh, please uh, post them and we'll be moderating and looking at the chat session to see if we should answer these questions live or directly to you. So um, as we get the questions going, I kind of wanted to pose a question to the uh, group of faculty we have on, you know, as orthopedic surgeons, we do a good job of looking at an x-ray, getting consultants help us with the soft tissue envelope and the vascular injuries, but uh, depression, as we just talked about in the last video, and social situations, are they married, do they have a job, things can impact outcomes. So in your current practice, um, how do you manage the social component and the psychological component of these patients with mangled extremities? For me, uh, that actually plays a very uh, crucial role, uh, especially you know when you don't have to amputate it immediately and you have time to discuss uh, uh, with the patient regarding uh, salvage um, or amputation. Uh, you get into getting to know them a lot better and, and discuss with them. Uh, you know, the pros and cons of it. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it's also been helpful in my experience is sometime when you have patients that have undergone amputation, um, uh, they actually uh, are willing to talk to the patients to, uh, uh, to tell them, you know, if they would do amputation, this is what to expect. And I think that helps them with regards mm -hmm. to deciding uh, what to do. Yeah, this is Mike Bossy. I know I'm, I'm retired now, so what I'm going to speak to is the two years old, two year old data. But in my prior uh, practice, um, we would do PTSD uh, screening in clinic on our patients to see if they were, you know, uh, manifesting any symptoms, and if they were, we'd refer them to uh, 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 social workers or um, the uh, regional uh, psychiatrist. Um, In-house for the patients that had severe injuries, we used peer counselors, and we had a group of, uh, of patients with similar injuries, like Tom may have mentioned, and they would come and see the patients and help you know, them work through the, uh, the, the issues that they were going to be facing, and we, I thought that was very helpful. If I was going to answer that question, how we, how we do this at our center, I would say poorly, because we... I, I think we all recognize it's a, it's a big issue. And as Mike said, you know, we can screen people for things, but I think we often have, at least in our center, a real trouble getting the psychiatry team and other people, you know, we have a lot of depression, PTSD, and anxiety in these patients. And we often don't feel comfortable treating those medically or otherwise. And we, at least in our center, and I'll talk to a lot of other people have the same problem. We have trouble involving therapists and psychiatrists in the work of these patients. And I think it's a real area for improvement. I think the peer counseling stuff is, seems to be helpful, um, but it's tough to set a lot of that stuff up. And so I think this is a real growth area for our field. You know, Mike's work in LEAP and others have has pointed out how important this is, but now like what can we do once we identify them? I think there's a lot of work that needs to go into how do we how do we help people? We know this is a risk factor. Can we actually change it and, and help them? And I think that's very, that's a much of an open question. Yeah, I, I think Bob brings up a really good point. It's like you, you're afraid to ask the question uh, sometimes because you don't want the answer. It's like asking the patient how much they drink 
and defining they're an alcoholic and we don't have an alcohol recovery program or treatment program to send them to, particularly if there's no funding attached to it. And most of the time, the patients that do have PTSD have it because, you know, they have uh, poor social support and, you know, other stresses in their life that the trauma has, uh, has accentuated and they don't typically have the insurance mechanisms to see a private psychologist, psychiatrist. So left with the you know friendly orthopedic surgeon who may or not be comfortable giving them a pharmacologic agent. Most of us aren't. So um, a, a question from the chat is, uh, if you have a, how do faculty approach conversations with a patient you feel would do better with an amputation, but the patient is strongly opposed to the amputation. Uh, Dr. O'Toole, why don't you go first and give us your thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, it's really tough. Um, unfortunately, that's often the case. It's often um, even harder when you're talking with the patient's family, which is typically the situation where the patient's intubated and it's difficult. I was just doing this on Monday um, and the family and everyone is very adamant against what I'm recommending. And it is, it's really tough. I do lean on LEAP and some of the, the stuff. And also I sometimes, if it's possible, you, you have to wait a little bit, but it is, it is tough because it is, you know, there's a big emotional component there. And um, it's not your life, it's not your leg. And it's hard to value how much you know, having my own leg means to somebody, even though you might say it's gonna be a terrible leg with an awful outcome, you'd be so much better with a amputation. And I try and do some of the stuff you just heard, having talked to people who've had amputations, hopefully the ones who've done well and, uh, and do those sort of things. But it is, it's really tough. And this is a place where you know, shared decision-making is difficult because you you don't really know exactly what's going to happen with these patients for sure, and they push you on it, right? They're like, "Well, are you sure that I won't have you know this side of the other outcome?" And you don't know for sure. Yeah, it, it puts you in a bad spot because if you're struggling, if you're arguing for amputation, and they make you limb salvage, and you wind up with a complication that goes goes on amputation, you know, because well, you didn't try very hard. So I usually try to engage, you know, my uh, plastic surgeon, my rehab doctors and have them give their opinion. Often it supports mine. And then I ask my partners if to see the patient and ask if any of them would volunteer to save the leg. And, you know, and if one does, then it becomes his patient. Because I, I really feel strongly that, I mean, I don't want to uh, invest emotional, you know, time and talent and everything else into a leg that I think is going to do horrible, though I can if I needed to. But if somebody else feels real more strongly about it, geez, I really want to do this, then I, that's perfect. Um, I agree. If Apple doesn't fall from the tree, I was trained by Bossy. All right. Um, another question that was in the chat was, and maybe for Dr. Bossy, is there any lab values that would uh, drive you towards limb salvage or amputation? That's not talked a lot about in a lot of the papers um no i mean i, I think if i have uh, uh you know uh, a, a ton of my globin in my urine when i'm looking at a leg that i want to you know thinking about and that leg's coming off for you know to, to, to minimize the uh the, the the arenal insult but other lab values you know I, if the patient is an extremist, then it's not a question. You know, amputation is a better option than limb salvage if the patient's still sick in the ICU for weeks with a bad head and other issues. Um, if you know the other, if all things are equal, then the physiology is the same. I uh, I see no really good lab values there. We're looking now at uh, at inflammatory markers and and uh, genetic uh, signaling that might might help us select patients or at least timing of operation for patients and perhaps identify the patients that aren't good candidates for multiple, you know, multiple stage reconstructive processes because it may negatively in fact, impact their other organ systems that might be injured too, but we don't have that information yet. Do you have any lab value that you use or suggest? 
No, uh, not not particularly. I you know, I think if someone like you said is an extremist and amputating the limb will uh, save their life, I think that's the life of a limb debate. But I don't have any particular lab values that I use. I don't know, Dr. Talarico, Marchand, or Lee or O'Toole, do you have any lab values you use? I don't really have any lab values. I mean, I guess you could, you know, a trick answer, you could say super high hemoglobin A1C or something, you know, medically about the patient that makes salvage really difficult. But I do think the, the, the life over um, limb argument, you know, sort of you just say that flippantly, like that's no, that's an obvious decision. And acutely when it happens, I think it mostly is pretty much an obvious decision. But I think sometimes we miss it where we wind up doing six or seven operations on somebody in the ICU and then they get septic and this, that, and something else happens to them and then they die. And you're like, well, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't us. We didn't have anything to do with it, but we keep hitting them over and over and over again with surgical burden. And so I do think it, we can play a role. We don't realize sometimes with these complex reconstructions physiologically and what we're doing to the patient, uh, the, those patients that are very ill. And I do think that kind of needs to be in the back of your mind that you can cause bad harm to them systemically in certain patients uh, by just operating on them over and over again in an attempted at limb salvage. Yeah, I think the Bob's point that, you know, when the patient is that sick and they're on ECMO and they've got, you know, severe pulmonary and other head injuries that are going on that, you know, it, it's it's a tough call to make and particularly a limb that you think you could salvage with a reasonable, you know, result, but the, but the circumstances aren't right. And that's a good time to have a conversation with the general surgeon and then the family and say, this patient's limbs, life is at risk if we continue to work on the limb. And we, you know, the general surgeon will write a supportive note and you write a note that states that this has to come off to save the patient's life. Three weeks later, it's a better picture, but you tell the patient, hey, you know, we cut your leg off because you were gonna die. And uh, most of the time they understand the, uh, in a very, very nice way that you did what you had to do. Actually, for me, the only lab value that I may use is not so much in the acute setting as like if you go down the route of limb salvage and, you know, uh, you're going to come back in stage and they get sent home, everything's actually a nic nicotine level. So, uh, you know, with regards to smoking wise, I think that, that plays a really crucial role for, for me, you know, if, uh, if I can't trust them that they stop smoking. as part of this, we've talked about patient counseling. How often do you use clinical imaging or pictures? This comes from our audience to aid the discussion. Um, do you show them pictures of the traumatic injuries, et cetera? And how, if you do, how do you bring this up and how do you introduce it? I, I personally don't do it very often, but I have partners who do for sure. Um, and I think it is useful sometimes, and especially if you have a way that you can sort of, you know, you have a bead pouch or something on it that you can sort of see what the limb looks like. I think that can be very helpful in the in certain situations uh, to kind of let them understand. You know, in a lot of these cases, even if you're doing reconstruction, I think when civilians, you know, see what this looks like, lay people see what this looks like, they can really say, wow, you know, no surprise, it got infected or there's a problem. You know, they just kind of see the magnitude of the problem. So I do think, it, I personally don't use it a lot, but I think it, it, people use it to great effect. And I think it's definitely a very reasonable approach. Yeah, I would uh, employ that uh, technique a lot of times in patients where, you know, they, they were on the fence or I tried to convince them, you know, that amputation might be a better option. You know, the, often you can't stage it so they can see the extremity, you know, without the, with a wound, a wound vac on it, they can see the size of the wound, but can't see the wound. But if you show them the pictures of the, the injury uh, films and then the injury uh, photo and then the post uh, uh images, um, often it'll give them a visual of what their leg looks like and how difficult it's, uh, the reconstruction might be and what the final, you know, disability result might be. And I think it gives them some good information to use. Um, and I've, I've had nobody look away. So, you know, that suggests that they're as interested as I am. We had a, another interesting question from the audience about osseous integration and how this may improve outcomes following uh, amputation. 
It's certainly not indicated, you know, in the acute traumatic amputation setting, but potentially down the road is a recon, sort of a reconstructive viable option. I have a little bit of a skewed view of osseous integration because we do that at my center at the VA here, and I've seen it, both the good and the bad that comes with it, but is uh, anybody else on the panel have experience with this, and does it come into your calculus when you're making a decision regarding limb salvage versus amputation? Is it, is it being used more than experimental now for um, uh, transtibial amputations, or is it still mainly in the in the femur? I can only speak on my at my center. It's still only being used for transfemoral amputations, but I know that I think it's still only being experimentally used and investigated in the transtibial setting. But somebody could certainly jump in with more expertise in the realm if if somebody's got it. Not something we routinely do at our center. Yeah, I don't. I don't have experience with that, but I know uh, my oncologists, uh, you know, have done one or two and uh, out there, but um, but not in a, um, the acute setting. Yeah, I would say being at a center where it, it's sort of peripherally done. Um, I would have to see a little bit more compelling evidence before it would factor into my decision to proceed with an amputation or felt like a patient was going to get a better functional outcome with it. I just uh, think there is still a lot of technology and advancements to be made in terms of the integration process and making sure that patients don't have long-term consequences of osteomyelitis and, and um, getting, the, getting a nice uh, skin seal on the prosthetic. So I, I, I tend to have seen um, a fair bit of complications. When they work, they're a home run. Uh, and when they don't work, it, it can be problematic. So. So um, one question that, uh, you know, not everyone that's on here is going to be doing limb salvage and trauma and trauma day to day, but they're going to have to take call probably. And so, and with all this, the data we have now, is there absolute indications to amputate? And what are they in your mind? And I'm just curious what, uh, what you think, Dr. Lee, any absolute indications to acutely amputate? I certainly the absolute indication is when the um, vascular surgeon um, uh, do not feel that they can uh, repair uh, a uh, of a vessel. And then another one is where the plastic surgeon does not uh, think that they can uh, um, flap or give soft tissue coverage that is uh, meaningful uh, for recovery. Well, I think for the on-call doctor at a non-trauma uh, center who might see this patient, the um, an absolute indicate the absolute indication for acute amputation would be inability to, to maintain or, or reestablish perfusion. Um, if they're unsure and they have perfusion, they can have, you know obviously temporize it with an X fix, debride it, and then ship it off to a more senior center um, and let them make the uh, decision. You know if it's a blast injury where there's muscle everywhere, bone everywhere, and soft tissue everywhere, and you may have one little vessel intact, but there's there's near, really nothing alive from the knee to the foot, then I think that's a, a, a call that isn't hard to make and just to breed dead tissue till you're done and usually it's an amputation. Yeah, and the only thing I have to add is what was already mentioned is, you know, the other absolute indication is the patient is bleeding out and dying and it's, you know, those patients I think are somewhat obvious. <laughs> But you know, just for completeness to mention that that's that's an indication, kind of regardless of what the situation is, if you have to take the foot off to save their life, obviously that's well. So, be. so Bob, what, what, so you, so that's that, that's a good point. So you're going to do a, a uh, amputation for trauma in a patient who's hypo, uh, who's coagulopathic and cold and all the other issues. So, do you do a formal amputation, or do you do a guillotine, or do you you know what what are you what are your goals when you do that amputation? Yeah, I, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't come up that often, but, you know, obviously, my goal is different there. I'm trying to make the patient survive. The patient is an extremist, and so trying to get through things quickly. Often, you wind up amputating through the fracture site because that's expeditious, and you have, you know, that's kind of where you are. 
I don't love it when, you know, sometimes trauma team will take the patient in the middle of the night and literally just do a guillotine, which often means that the actual amputation will have to come up significantly from where that is because there's no soft tissue to cover at that level, which obviously is okay, right? The, the patient's alive, so that's good. But if I can, without taking a bunch of time, I try and think a little bit about the level. But this isn't the time to be spending, you know, an hour and a half doing, you know, meticulous dissection uh, when the patient's dying on the table. And so um, I, I think about the ultimate level a little bit and try and save some skin if I can. But I also think in those situations, you gotta, you got to move quickly. Um, you can't be part of the problem. you got to sort of help solve the problem. Do you have anything, Mike, you do differently? No, pretty much the same thought process. How does age factor into the decision making for you guys in the uh, limb salvage versus amputation pathway? Both on both extremes, uh, they've come up as questions from the audience, like in the pediatric patient um, versus the geriatric patient. I think for me, certainly the pediatric has a lot more reserve and, and uh, if the limb is uh, still viable, I think uh, you have to uh, uh, go the route of salvage and be much more conservative. They have, a, uh, I think, more potential to recover. Uh, in the elderly population, I think that's where it gets into where um, uh, is it better for them to, you know, have an amputation, especially below the knee amputation, where they can still uh, use a prosthesis and ambulate uh, uh, and still have uh, move on with their life a lot quicker than to uh, be going to six months to a year of limb salvage uh, uh, when I look at the elderly patient-wise. I don't have too much to add to that. I, I think that you know, you, I was trying to sort of think in my mind, do younger people or older people, are they more likely to argue for amputation or reconstruction? I'm not sure I really have a stereotype of that. You know, I, I've got patients who argue for all sorts of different treatments for all sorts of different reasons. And um, I, I do think that one thing that I've, anecdotally I feel is true is that patients' families are, are really adamant against amputation often, unless it's like, you know, to save their life sort of waiting for the patient to be extubated and have them involved in it. More often patients are more willing to do an amputation than the family is without talking to the patient. Yeah, it's interesting that there's a time trade-off uh, scoring. And I wonder if the older, older population would be, it probably varies on their health condition and uh, how they're just living life as to how much time they'd be willing to trade for nearly a, a, a normal or a functional limb. So, um, so that's an interesting question. So good. All right. Um, well, we're coming down. Uh, I've got about uh, five, 10 minutes left here uh, before wrapping up. Um, is there any advice, uh, Dr. Bossi, Dr. Atul, Dr. Lee, that uh, you'd like to impart to the group uh, before we close down the webinar tonight? And I don't know if Dr. Lee, if you're ready, if you could start. Yeah, I think um, when it comes to a limb salvage, which uh, just kind of know that if you don't have to acutely amputate, just plan on um, uh, coming after your first case uh, at, uh, at the end of the day to have at least a good half an hour to an hour of discussion. It's not something that you try to round on the patient and quickly talk to them before you go to the OR. So uh, that's something that I think is very crucial. And if they have family, that's even better. I, I encourage uh, the family to be there uh, because that way a lot of time is um, uh, the family can help, uh, you know, explain to the uh, patient uh, uh, what you have uh, told them and, and remind them. I think that's helpful in, in the terms of shared decision uh, when it comes to uh, deciding what to do. Yeah, I think there's no right answer, but I think it's really important to pay attention, listen to the patient, um, particularly, um, you know, their station in life and what their, you know, what their intent is in the next, uh, you know, decade. You know, and the particular example is, you know, the young person with a young family 
who has his own business who can't be out of work for more than three months, okay? If you give him these options, he's gonna basically state, listen, I probably need an amputation because I need to be back to my, you know, work as an electrician in my own business and out playing with my kids and I can't invest a year of my life and not know and, and have an outcome that's no better than a, uh, an amputation. And, and I wanna be back to work quickly. So it's, it's a good question to ask, you know, what are your goals and how close do you, how fast do you have to get there? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And, you know, you, it's funny, we all sort of pick the nothing about technical about how to do any of these surgeries, right? We're all talking about how to figure out what is best for this specific patient. Like, you know, the question you always get is, well, what would you do? Or what would you do if this was your son, mother, brother? And I try hard not to answer that question because I think it's sort of irrelevant, you know, crazy person why does it matter what a crazy person would do but i try and use like leap and some of this research to say well you know if this is important to you if getting back to work faster or getting out of the hospital is faster then maybe this treatment will be better but if this other thing is important to you then you should do this treatment and try and frame it in that way but it, it is it is really tricky because as you say you know to us it sounds like a lot to spend an hour half an hour talking to the patient as opposed to our usual 30 seconds and, uh, but think how little time that is really to try and understand. And the patient's trying to make this decision. You know, Dr. bossy has been thinking about this for decades, right? He's a world leader in this topic. And he would probably admit he still doesn't know what the right thing to do is for a patient. And this patient just started thinking about it a half hour ago. So it, it's, it's really tough to then sort of ask them, what do you think you want? They, they, they don't even maybe know someone with an amputation or know someone with a mangle limb that's been reconstructed, let alone on average, how are they going to do? So it's, it's a really tough, tough ask we have of the patients. But on the other hand, that's all we got. And so we have to do everything we can to try and give them what limited knowledge we have and let them help make the decision. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Bossi O'Toole and Dr. Lee. Uh, very great interviews, and I appreciate the discussion. Uh, Dr. Marchand, Dr. Tallarico, any final thoughts or uh, comments? No, I just want to say thank you to all three guests. Uh, sincerely appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Hi, right, welcome. Yeah, this was fun. And I always find these uh, journal clubs incredibly educational. Good job picking the articles. Thanks uh, to the authors always for showing up. Your wisdom is, um, I think it's cool that these things are going to live online too on YouTube for everybody to enjoy in the future. So thanks. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Bye. Well, well, thank you, everyone. Here are some take-home points for the audience. And again, thank you to the AO staff, the authors, and Dr. Talarico and Merchan for the help getting this together. Everyone have a good evening and uh, stay safe.